I, I just very much look forward to um, hearing your thoughts and the feedback as we discuss. I'm totally, I can see uh, raise hand, so just raise hands and uh, I can let you ask questions. So just like Michelle said, um, this is, uh, culture is very dear to us. I guess personal experience, I was very lucky to be in a place with great culture so that I always think about exactly how culture can affect corporate uh, performance, for example. So here, let's motivate analysis also, just like Michelle said, this is in everybody's mind. So let's just motivate that from the field. So I just want to highlight a number of CEOs quotes regarding culture. So like, uh, so this is a former CEO from IBM, a guest owner. He talked about culture, it's the only game, it's the only game. And also co-founder and the CEO of Costco, that's also, this is the only thing. So clearly culture or organization culture or corporate culture is very important to the, to the corporate decision maker at the very top, including the CEOs and also the founders. What is also relevant to us is that this is a quote from another co-founder, also Navidia. They talk about um, culture has to come from the top, from the tones and actions of its leaders. That's exactly where we're going to measure corporate culture. Did I already have a chat? Oh, no. So what is corporate culture? It's something, it's a part of the grand scheme of things, the so-called intangible. So it's really, you live and breathing it, but it might be just very hard to capture. So from OBHR, from um, management scholars, culture is defined as shared values and norms that define appropriate attitude and behavior for organizational members. Think you are in a business school, you are in a corporation, that's the shared values and the norms within that particular organization. Moreover, both management scholars and also finance scholars have uh, come to the conclusion that corporate culture is not static, um, it's dynamic, but it's, it's it's evolving, slowly evolving over time. So it, it, you can call that path dependent. Culture comes from where it originally started and culture can also be shaped by major corporate events. An event that is very dear to Michelle is going public. No doubt going public can change a company's uh, culture. So as a major uh, deal making like m &As. So does corporate culture matter from the CEOs? Yes. So, but unfortunately we just do not have a lot of large, uh, large sample evidence about culture matters. So from management scholar, from the theory perspective, uh, management scholar argue that culture matters because in, when employees face choices without guidance, without the right incentive scheme, um, culture could properly regulate uh, employees. So later I'll talk about during COVID, how culture matters. So that's exactly um, in the second half of this presentation, I'll present empirical evidence that firms with a strong culture, now surprisingly, just like firms engage in ESG and the like, that they are more, uh, they outperform their peers. So later I'll talk more about that. So what motivates this work is really just because everybody thinks culture is so important by like empirical evidence, mainly from questionnaires and the surveys, so that uh, there's really not large sample evidence because it just so, everybody feels about it, but just so hard to measure it. So what is the methodological innovation of this paper is to use machine learning techniques. I'm, I read Michelle's paper as well. So we all got on that bandwagon of machine learning. So we're using word embedding model. So that's a technique and I'll talk more about that. And the corpus we use. So places we try to capture corporate culture is what CEOs are saying during earnings calls to measure corporate culture. So for some of us who have done research familiar with earnings calls, it typically involves top executives. So primary CEOs, CFOs, COOs, and, and the like, that they speak to analysts and the review. So many talk about what they have done to justify their performance and provide guidance for future. But in between uh, what this, we are talking about, it will reveal the set of values that are important to a company. Remember the 
uh, Jensen Huang's quote from the video, the culture and culture is really come from the top. But then how do we, uh, how do we get started? We start from uh, another prior work of us, uh, before us, that's Gil So Yitao. They look at S&P 500 firms, so the largest companies in the US, look at their website and look at, so at a particular point, so early to, uh, 2012 or so, they look at what values those most successful firms promote on their website. And they came up with nine values and we're just going to uh, use the top five most mentioned values among the largest companies in the US. So given that we introduced a new method, so it's important. Oh, Dan, just a moment. So how do I let attendee speak then? Okay, more. Um, can, you, can you talk? How do I make? Uh, Dan, can you talk now? Um, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. I just did it. Uh, hi, I, I wonder. Uh, I wonder how do you distinguish between uh, culture and uh, employees' bargaining position? Like in your uh, COVID nineteen case, maybe in these firms, the employees are have, is more are more powerful, so they can ask the company to provide more for them, which is different from culture. That think. that's no, that's a great one. I think that part you most likely you will great question. The, that most likely you will get it from Glassdoor when employees really have a free space to speak. You remember the places I'm measuring culture is not even from 10K, it's from Q&As. So Q&As are where CEOs answer questions from analysts. It's just highly unlikely. Uh, analysts might ask ESG related uh, probes, but it's just not going to be the major one. If you have seen enough um, uh, earnings call transcripts, I think it's going to be gaining more attraction going forward, but at least in our setting, um, that's not going to be a dominant effect. Remember what I'm also going to cover is because this is a new method and also it's a new place to score culture, try to be convincing. We need to do a lot of validation. Okay, thank you. Yeah. But what you said are correlated with respect and teamwork and integrity. It's, they all correlated a lot of the uh, positive attributes of firm, yeah. So that's what we're going to do. So we start with somebody else has done uh, like and also very credible, which is SP 500 firms, what values they promote, etc. We're just going to extend that in, in mass, in a uh, like large sample over time, we can build a panel data. By the way, so the data we have is, avail uh, is available upon request. So here we are. So also re related to Dan's question, right? If we start, if we start like, uh, without some delineation of what we have in mind, we might end up into not capturing culture, but something else. So here is a total transparency. So this is a cut paste from Gilso Itao GFE paper. So remember, the, so these are the top five values they identify from SP 500 firms. So how do you read those five points? So the first one is like, so that's what we're going to capture the five values. So integrity, teamwork, innovation, respect, and the quality. But what they also did, uh, something in machine learning, we call that a seed word. They actually did manually is to look at um, um, about the integrity. What are other words company also come, uh, frequently use to support their claim about they care about the integrity. So the words after integrity, we call that those seed words. So like teamwork, really straightforward. There's only two supporting or explanation for what they, make, they mean teamwork is collaboration and cooperation. So there's only two seed words for that. What I also highlighting in yellow is actually the words that show up on SP500 the website. They actually do not show up that often in earnings call or they show up in earnings call for a very different meaning, has nothing to do with in integrity, but something else, for example. So those yellow highlights, we will exclude ownership. During earnings calls, ownership is really just about the share, uh, shareholder base, has nothing to do with uh, integrity. So we drop that to reduce some uh, noise uh, in our measure. So what is the word embedding model? Uh, so 
this project, uh, we started this project almost four years ago. So I think now many people are doing word embedding just in case uh, for information. So what is a word embedding is just uh, based on a very uh, well established concept in linguistic. That is words of similar meaning or means synonym tend to happen adjacent to each other in a document. So positive words tend to cluster around each other in a, in a document and the vice versa negative words. So what we do in, uh, in large scale is to use the entire corpus, which is earnings calls, to develop what we, we call the culture dictionary. So the key words that define the value such as integrity or the key words that define the value such as teamwork. So word embedding uh, is allow us uh, to find those synonyms by vectorizing each word into a vector, like 300 by one vector. And those vectors just capture the frequency of the neighboring words. And those neighboring words essentially explain the keyword. But once we uh, vectorize each word by a vector, we can do a vector uh, representation and to find the cosine similarity and we can extend. And it's through that uh, uh, cosine similarity, we can expand to uh, to build our own. So like basically create our own dictionary uh, of similar uh, words of similar meanings, synonyms. So that's what we do. That is, uh, we think integrity is important, but to score whether IBM has high uh, integrity, we then need to, to develop a dictionary that all the words that are related to integrity and IBM use those words a lot, then we define that uh, then we come to the conclusion that IBM has high integrity. Of course, there are always a concern about the claimed value versus what's actually going on. So validation becomes very important. So here just shows a, like a toy example that there are three words, assuming you're not using a dictionary, assuming you have no knowledge of those three words. So suppose there are three words called collective partnership and governance. We want to find out uh, how similar they are in meaning so what we do is to go to a body of text to look at the neighboring words around those three words. And uh, to, then, we get, then we get a vector representation for the three words. Then we do cosine similarity to define, uh, uh, to identify synonyms. So here we are. So suppose the objective is to understand the relation between these three words. So our ultimate goal is to get a, dictionary of words, say for integrity. So here, assuming a toy example, we want to find the meaning, how related the three words are. So we go to a body of text, we find for collective, uh, the neighboring words counts. So horizontally, the first row, so neighboring uh, words count is like share, fruitful, joint, oversight, proper. And for partnership governance, we get all those counts. So once we have the three vectors, we can do uh, for, for the meaning of each word, based on the frequency of the neighboring words, we can do a cosine similarity. Then we realize mm, a collective and a partnership, their uh, cosine similarity is higher than collective and governance. So that suggests that collective is a closer synonym to governance than partnership. So that's just a toy example. Um, in reality, word embedding is pretty well established in computer science to implement. So, and it's so versatile that previously people just use unigram, like one word. If you do word embedding carefully, you actually can capture phrases and idioms that really uh, define a particular corporate uh, value. So for example, here for innovation in our, in our own dictionary words for to define innovation, capture innovation, when manager talk about say, pushing the envelope, we know that is highly correlated about their intent that the firm is innovative. So like teamwork, uh, so there's a hand, so like idioms could also be captured through word embedding. So here for sanity test, so first of all, to see just like the question before, do we capture what we intend to capture or we just capture noise? So here just showing you under, so remember our goal is to score a company in five dimensions, say IBM, is IBM innovative or is IBM high on teamwork? So here just showing you in other, so this is just like the culture dictionary and we show you the top 30 words that define each value. 
So for innovation, the top one is creativity, the innovative, innov innovate, et cetera. So that's just like to show what we are doing. Then in order to score a uh, culture, given that earnings calls are frequently done at quarterly frequency, so each firm will have multiple earnings calls. So we're just going to take an annual frequency count of the frequency, those words I show you in the previous slide for each firm year. And just in case there are any noise or volatility in earnings call discussion, our ultimate measure is based on a three-year moving average uh, for, for particular uh, firms annual uh, corporate, corporate value score. So just uh, like, so think about where we are today. We are in a, a knowledge economy. So innovation quality, human capital intangible are the buzzwords in everybody's mind. So not surprisingly, so this just shows the scope of our data, which is firm and the year. So it's uh, so from 01 to 2018, uh, roughly 2018. So here just shows the raw scores for the sample. So a high level summary is that innovation is the most frequently mentioned the value. While this is again, is during earnings calls. So integrity is the least frequently mentioned the culture value. So that's just like a first uh, impression. Then we also, just like my response a moment ago, you can imagine because this is all corporate values, they are all virtues. So not surprisingly, they will be positively correlated. That's indeed the case. And innovation and the quality has the highest correlation, close to 0.5, while innovation and the integrity is the lowest, about 0.1. So these are just some summary stats. Uh, like just to help you understand exactly, uh, like gain some understanding of what we are doing, but could, uh, like whether it's consistent with intuition to us, this is consistent with our tuition is that quality and innovation would also go hand in hand. What is, we also want to show is uh, for some of you doing cultural research or national culture, we know that uh, national culture also slowly evolving. So here in a very dynamistic economy like US, we want to show that culture uh, so firms' corporate culture evolve over time, as I mentioned before, shaped by going public, shaped by m &As, and also firms could excel in multiple dimensions of culture. So this is just like an overview of what I, I'm saying. So our sample is like 21 years. What we did is divide 21 years into three seven-year period. And then, so this shows among top uh, five, top um, SP500 firms, um, what are the firms that score high along those dimensions? Uh, so, so across industry and also over time. So I'm highlighting a number of them. So the blue box shows Procter Gamble. So we know that is consumer goods uh, conglomerate. They excel in innovation across all three periods of uh, the sample period. And this, so they basically always top 10 firms along innovation. In a yellow box, I saw, I saw Salesforce. So a company like Salesforce could also excel in multiple dimensions of uh, their values. So that's innovation and the quality. Yeah, so this just shows that a firm can outperform their peers consistently, but there's also changes over time for firms to be in and out of the top uh, performing list in terms of culture and firm also can excel in multiple dimensions. What really also revealing for us is we also sort, uh, provide a time series plot across 12 industries. And in the, we are still in the, in the public health crisis. So this shows that for healthcare industry among pharma French 12 industries, they really stand out in terms of integrity and also teamwork. To us, this is consistent with our intuition, people in that, uh, in that particular industry. These are the really important attributes for success and also important for us as customers to that industry. So I had the first question before that from Dan that, how do I know I'm measuring what I intend to measure? And this is a very valid concern. Uh, that is, we all know there's a, in finance, we know there's a window dressing. So there's always concern that what they say, especially management, is not what they practice. <laughs> so we're going to address that concern in multiple dimensions. 
So the very first thing is to validate uh, our measure using some well-established markers for best practice. A simple example is innovation. There's so much work uh, have done in innovation. There's so many different measures for corporate strength in innovation, including their number of patents, citations, expenditure, as well as MSCI uh, scoring of a firm's R&D strength, like it used to be called KLD. So that's like one place we're going to uh, to look into is cross-validate, look at the known markers for innovation and to see all those known markers are they highly correlated with our score for corporate culture innovation. So the other thing we're going to do is, uh, the other thing we're going to do is, we know that earnings call could be just a show, but the earnings call has two components. One is presentation, so prepare the remarks where gaming or claim or advertising a particular value is more likely, but well, Q&A is like just spontaneity is hard. But as again, earnings call is really for firm to justify what they have done and what they will be doing. Earnings call uh, venue is really not a place for firm to promote culture. Uh, so, or provide, promote their virtues. So that's also another reassuring factor in our analysis. So here, just showing you a bit of our uh, validation and our apologies for this uh, really uh, not great uh, size, the font. So here, like for quality, so left-hand side, so the variable quality is our score, then product quality, safety uh, are from KLD, top brand from a marketing company. So we see consistent correlation across two out of three measures. Then for respect, again, we rely on a KLD for diversity. We also uh, from the ranking of best employers and to get a, a validation. And what I also want to highlight in, okay, because I changed the font. So uh, innovation. So innovation, we really want to highlight is that our measure is so comprehensive. It captures corporate innovation beyond the euro measures like patents, R&D spending, uh, innovation strength is from KLD. So for some of us who do research innovation, we know that there's severe missing data problem for R&D expenditure, like 40% of firms has missing information on that. And for patents, maybe like majority of the firms do not have any patents. So in our case, our innovation measure is based on any firm who holds earnings call. So we have far more comprehensive measure for that. Oh, great. So. Yes, uh, just moment. Hi, Kai. It's Michelle. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, perfect. Very well. I was wondering, just out of curiosity, have you looked at whether your measures predict what would happen in the future? So I could imagine a firm talking about innovation if they wanted to start becoming more innovative or talking more about integrity if they were like worried that, oh, you know, some analyst it's, you know, expressed doubt we need to beef up on this measure? Could, could it be a signal of things to come? That's a great question. We didn't look at that because we were so worried just to like try to be convincing. I'm but totally also, convinced, but I'm but No, 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 but there are, there are issues, Michelle, you asked. That's a great one. That is, um, so they're always concerned about aspiration versus what they do. So culture, to be honest, uh, there is an aspirational component. Right. Like we all but know you, that, like our school aspire to do so and they put on that, that's our values. Yeah. Right, exactly. But it might be that you could use this to your benefit as well, right? Because as you mm -hmm. highlighted in the beginning, culture is dynamic. It does, it's yeah. not just static over time. So if you could use your measure, perhaps, you know, with the word bundling approach, you know, what other words occur around it, mm -hmm. you might be able to mm -hmm. capture some of those dynamic aspects in ways that would be really cool. Yes, yes. Duly noted. Uh, we didn't do that, but so also it's very hard. Is you know that what what you just suggest is predictive. That's great, but still, I mean, we all in corporate finance is uh, indulgent is all over the place. So right, so the analysis in this particular project is just establish uh, association. But you're yeah. right. Yeah. No, I totally you're understand. Right. Yeah. That, but, yeah. You. Uh, yeah. So some of the analysis later will show a little bit of predictive, but that's a corporate event, which means culture congruency associated with deal uh, incidents. 
but that's just an event, like uh, instead of what you have in mind. Yeah. But what you just said is also a little bit tricky because of data. That yeah. is my innovation measure uh, is any firm has earnings call. I would have like six, uh, I have eight to 9,000 unique firms. But in reality, innovation, especially like patent producing corporations, is only like the largest ones. So for the smaller ones, we might still not. And also, you know, that's also I just claimed our measure is broader than the euro metrics, which are narrow and rewarding largest firms. So if you had better data on innovation or analysts doing more surveys, et cetera, maybe there will be even close a tighter connection as you have suggested. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, it's interesting. Thanks. Thank you. No. So you see, we, we do have trouble like integrity as well. How do you call, like validate the integrity? So we just have to be quite creative to use like, like the, the opposite side, like firm has a track record of restatement or backdating. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. So, um, so that was just like cross validation, but like what we also do is we are not the first one at the same time, people also, other people thinking to measure corporate culture. So what we want to do is to make sure our measure is uh, relatively clean, um, is to uh, entertain alternative ways of measuring culture. The very first one, which is very easy for us, our main measure is based on Q&A because spontaneity less like to be window dressing. So the alternative measure is to use the full call, which including prepared uh, remarks, which is the so-called presentation part. Second is why go out, uh, why uh, like go uh, take a, a machine learning route if that Gilso et al. in their GFE paper already listed uh, the values and also the seed words. So another alternative approach is just do a simple count of the words uncovered by Gilso et al. and see how they perform relative to us using machine learning approach. Third is that uh, earnings call. Um, earnings call is to analyst. So firm also has other uh, dissemination channel. Michelle also used that in her work, like uh, prospectors, annual reports. So annual reports. So why not just look at annual reports where managers has a, dis a management discussion analysis that commonly used in accounting research. So we could also score culture just using a part the particular section, section seven of 10K. Um, so here, oh, so this is just showing you, uh, so we run a horse race. So just give you an example, because we have five measures, we just use one. Here, that is innovation. So there are four different measures of innovation. So this one is from us. The rest are alternative approach. We look at the strengths of correlation of our measure versus uh, the alternatives this, uh, in relation to the common markers for innovation. So that's like number of patents, spending, and the innovation strength from KLD. So you see that uh, culture measured elsewhere, uh, they, they actually showed up negative correlated with the common markers of innovation. But that also, who knows, like maybe people can also argue patents aren't spending not the full picture of innovation. So that's, that's aside, that's not our concern uh, here. So the other, we also, in addition to use different method, different corpus, uh, like textual uh, data, we also do, um, like the question before, uh, there are more data now, is from what, so right, so earnings call is what top people saying about their values. How about the rank and file employees at the bottom say about their firm? Of course, bearing in mind the glass door is the prerequisite for glass door is you have to some typically are people looking for jobs. So there might be some negative influence there. But for us, when we start four years ago, I do not know today, glass doors coverage is relatively patchy as compared to earnings call, which started in early 2000 due to regulation FD. So that and for textual analysis, we need a lot of data. So that, uh, so Glassdoor is a little bit out for us. Lastly, we, we what we did, our method is to create our own culture dictionary by using word embedding to find a synonym. Another very uninformed, but also powerful uh, textual analysis um, is actually uh, topic modeling. So just, you only, uh, <laughs> you only need to tell, like say, uh, say earnings call, you only need to say, 
uh, I pre-specified there's going to be 30 or 50 topics uh, in earnings call. You just give that and, the, and you get the output about topics. So here we try the from 20 to 200 topics. We have that in the internet appendix. You just look at the word cloud, which give you a rough idea about what the key uh, things uh, in earnings calls. To us, it's mostly about performance, really not. Uh, so if you do a, a very uh, um, non-supervised machine learning, we, our approach is semi-supervised, you do not get what you want to capture, which is culture. But that's also a good thing. It means unintended consequence of earnings call for us, because we have some guidance, we are able to capture culture. It's unintended. Managers are really not with the full purpose to promote certain values. So that helped us to some extent. So the application we did is to look at M&As. So there's so much work done in M&As about sources of synergies and the drivers of M&As. The one area we want to look at is called culture fit. So we want to look at acquire a target firm along those five culture dimensions. Are they close or are they are further apart? So you can have a story of substitution or complementarity. Uh, that's the same, same like in real life about finding a partner. Like do people have similar or opposite the personality would be better or a good, better or worse fit. But anyway, what we find is actually really culture congruency. That is firms uh, closer in culture value are more likely to get together. What's also interesting for us, and also one of the themes from this research is uh, corporate culture is evolving over time, shaped by major corporate events. So going public, definitely. A classical example is Goldman, Goldman going public. So there are a lot of discussion about their culture changed. So here we also find something from human, uh, uh, like anthropology, social and, uh, uh, yeah, sociology and anthropology, this concept called acculturation. That is when two tribes get together, the combined tribe actually reflect a uh, capture characteristic of those, those two merging tribes. So we call that acculturation. So how do we uncover that is, so, so say IBM acquired Red Hat, it's very recent, but just as an example. So what we show is that one to three years down the road, look at the surviving firm, IBM, their CEOs talking about their culture. So what we find is that combined firm, the surviving firm, one year to three years down the road, very strikingly that there are always traces of the target uh, culture values correlated with the subsequent surviving firm's uh, culture. So that's what we call that culture is shaped by m and in, in fact, IBM's culture down the road will also be shaped by the entrepreneurial characteristics of Red Hat. So this is the first half. <laughs> uh, so what we do here is um, using the word embedding model. So this is the amount of data we have. So really grateful to regulation FD that earnings cost of public information. So this is the amount of earnings call transcript we obtain to get uh, the score of five culture values for almost 70,000 firm years and over almost, yeah, so, so 18 years. So the data is available upon request. So what we show is that uh, in our measure of innovation is broader than the euro measure of innovation, like just based on R&D expenditure or patents, which tend to suffer from severe missing data problem. We, I didn't show in this presentation, but in the paper, we also show that culture correlates with business outcome, but not what Michelle suggests, like predictive, we mainly just show uh, uh, association. So lastly, in the paper, we also show that uh, culture shaped by major corporate events. So not in our work by others, they show about the IPO. So that's Gilso et al, they had a case study, but in our case, we had a systematic evidence showing that uh, target culture will have its imprint of the uh, combined firm going forward. So before I move on, and this is perfect time for me to take a pause to see if there are any uh, follow-up questions. I'll ask one question and then hopefully some other people will jump in as well. Um, I'm intrigued by the last piece of evidence, how corporate culture is shaped by mergers. Um, 
I'm just sitting here wondering, did you do anything? Like, did you explore what types of mergers have the biggest effects? Like in some ways I could think that maybe an international merger would have a bigger effect because it's sort of more different. But then on the other hand, maybe the prediction goes the other way because if I'm acquiring a firm that's located in China, the employees perhaps are not really interacting on a regular basis day to day compared to a merger that's between two Silicon Valley firms. So I, I could see the predictions going either way. I was wondering if you all had thought about that. No, that's a, um, Michelle, that's a great one. So what we did is totally domestic, but as you're fully aware that at the international setting, actually a lot of uh, like uh, catastrophic um, cross-border transactions is uh, like it's claimed due to uh, culture misfit. So like Daimler and Chrysler, that's a historical, that's like a classic example. Right. So it also become very challenging, just like you said, there'll be two types of culture. There's a national, then there's an organizational. So it'd be really fun to disentangle. When we wrote the paper, we didn't get into international because there's already prior work by Ken Ahan, JFE. So they already look at a uh, culture misfit in an international setting. Right. I so, mean, but you said also a very good one. We do not, we need earnings call data to score. Yeah. Earnings. I mean, you could even, there's this old paper on VCs by, um, oh my gosh, who's it by? It'll come to me in a second. And he showed that the characteristics of VCs West Coast versus East Coast was just dramatically different, which you could imagine, right? Like California is different than New York City. So perhaps you could even <laughs> look at that, right? Um, uh, yes. Yes. And yes. so that would, I mean, you know, we all know that there's a difference between the East Coast of this country and the West Coast and the middle. So uh, yeah. perhaps you don't even need to go international. You could do yeah. sort of the same kind of thing closer. Yeah. Anyway, but I just thought, you know, it. that's a great one. But you think about the other top, hot topic is uh, political polarization. Yeah, no, that's right. That's so right. it's going to yeah. be, yeah, yeah. So it, you know, potentially you're going to run a horse race. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to Food for uh, thought. Yes. No, that's why people are here. So I'm going to uh, ask a wing team to speak and then Shan. Yeah. Hi, uh, Kai. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Um, so um, a very interesting paper and thank you for presenting it. And um, so my understanding of the innovation uh, culture here, does that also include like um, innovation or new product development instead of like scientific innovation. Um, because when I look at the table you presented, like the top um, top firms who have the highest innovation innovative culture are like those retailers. Um, so I I was surprised that those retailers actually have high scientific innovation. Um, culture and I was thinking is that like more of per new product development um, and different you know different different design different type of products um, is that included in this absolutely you know, uh, absolutely Bentin, you raise uh, like you the question really provide a great tra transition to my second half of the presentation I saw my calls or on the second paper is also here um, so uh, that is uh, it's broader. So in fact, um, it's any it's anything you can imagine about innovation. So next we're going to show exactly what you said, products, services, as well as very prompt pivot, uh, pivoting from physical presence to online presence. So this, uh, our measure capture that. Oh, thank you. So Shan? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yes, thank, first of all, thank you for this wonderful presentation. I'm very intrigued. I also, I'm glad to hear that you say the data is available, which I think what you did is basically opens up a lot of very interesting to study, but just to relate to what you are getting a little bit at the end, toward the end, you said you had a re uh, evidence that corporate culture is shaped by major corporate, even in particular the target, the post-merger uh companies start to bear reflect some part of the target one i also wonder since you already studying ma did you also take a look at the ma announcement effect because in ma is also well known that uh, culture is also big factor uh, affect the successfulness or failure of this merger do you see 
that if the parent versus the target, I mean, acquire and the target, if their culture is closer, more uh, aligned, then also it would be predict a more successful merger, so which we may expect a better announcement effect than those where the culture is less that's aligned. A, no, um, Shen, that's a great one. So if I recall, I think Han Yitao in the international uh, setting, they have a look at the price reaction. So for us, what we did is we did a merger pairing analysis. You also think in the US, shareholder activism, shareholder value creation is a big deal. So in our uh, like predictive analysis is what kind of firms getting together, we show that firms that uh, has culture fit. So they share same value for innovation, for quality or teamwork, they are more likely to get together. Well, firms that are not, they are not close in culture dimension. They do, so the counterfactual, they just do not get together. So not, as a result, uh, we actually do not sh uh, show, um, we do not see price reaction. I guess the other thing is culture is something intangible. Maybe the market didn't recognize that uh, for two reasons. The market didn't recognize, uh, deeply appreciate it. The other is bad ones that will receive negative price reaction because if they know that they are not a good fit, they just decided not to get together. So that's yeah. why so we didn't find a significant, uh, like our measure of culture congruency, culture fit and the price uh -huh. reaction. Yeah, we don't. Okay, yeah, that's also possible. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Did I have? Um, Okay, so maybe Shan, you uh, remove your raise hand, otherwise it's still there, but it's fine. Uh, so my collaborator from the sex, second project, project, Tang Fei, is also in the audience. Thank you, Tang Fei. So I'm going to continue with the application. 